A connected globe is the ultimate engine of problem solving and breakthrough innovation. Breakthrough innovation that comes from connecting millions of citizens and scientists and researchers and accountants and everyone to work on the important problems in the world one at a time. And this breakthrough innovation is happening today. It's happening in industries from consumer products to financial services to aerospace, and we're just at the beginning. Let me start first by defining closed innovation. Innovation 100 years ago uh, was, emblem, uh, was, em was emblemized by um, iconic figures like uh, Thomas Edison and Alfred Nobel. Over the last 50 years, new processes have emerged which help manage the innovation process, and they work very well to do that. They lower the risk and they improve innovation throughput. You should imagine in your mind that what we've created are systems that, where we build, we, we build large facilities and large buildings full of the researchers uh, that we think can solve the most important problems. We hire the best in the world to work on those problems. But we all know the fundamental limitation of that kind of a system. We couldn't hire all the smartest people in a given field if we wanted to. We can't. This is exactly why Innocentive was founded. Created originally by Eli Lilly, the pharmaceutical giant, the idea was very simple. Could we connect problems to problem solvers all over the world? And could we do that in a way that could solve the toughest problems, not just menial tasks, but some of the toughest problems in research, in policy, in all kinds of different areas? Today, Innocentive has over 270,000 problem solvers in over 200 countries. 61% have masters and PhDs. We reach over 12 million through our partnerships and through social media. This represents an enormous pool of intellectual and creative capacity worldwide that can, be brought to, that can be brought to bear on really important problems. Three things are incredibly important in this kind of a model. First, um, uh, the first is that it's massively parallel. What that means is that at any point in time, hundreds or thousands of individuals or teams or companies even might be working on the same problem at the same time. The second is it's highly self-selective. Only people or organizations that think they can solve these problems are actually working on them, which means it's highly efficient. And third, it's a pay-for-success model. What that means is only organizations are paying for solutions that meet their requirements. I think it was Thomas Edison that said he had learned 999 ways not to make a light bulb. Well, I can assure you his investors paid for all that failure. You don't have to. So to illustrate some of these concepts, let me share with you one of my favorite examples. This one is the solar flare problem. So NASA, for over 30 years, has recognized that when solar flares happen, an enormous amount of energy is released. As that energy hits the Earth, it wreaks havoc with satellite infrastructure, it puts the health and safety of astronauts on spacewalks outside the International Space Station at risk, it can even take out power grids on Earth. So how do we know that these solar flares are going to emit the energy that's required to essentially instruct astronauts to go into the space station to lock down really important telecommunications infrastructure. So the prior standard that NASA had been working on was a standard for the prior 30 years, was a standard that would give them four hours lead time with 50% accuracy. And so that was, that was the, the bar to beat. A new challenge was created, and we put it out there for the entire world to work on. And this challenge was data-driven forecasting of solar events. 529 solvers from all over the world engaged in this project from 53 different countries, and phenomenal ideas came in. The winning solution came from a retired researcher and amateur, radio, amateur ham radio operator from New Hampshire. His, his solution so blew away the folks at NASA um, that he won the prize. Now, this, this solution emerged within 90 days for a problem that had been vexing NASA for 30 years. And his solution was absolutely novel. Using original data analytics tools and predictive algorithms, he took that four hour lead time and increased it to eight hours. And 50% accuracy to 85% accuracy. This is a monumental leap forward with implications that would be clear to everyone. So it turns out we can all be rocket scientists at the end of the day. So let me share with you um, my thoughts on where innovation comes from. Innovation is increasingly not coming from deep inside the research labs, the closed innovation research labs as we've known them to date. And it's increasingly coming from non-traditional problem solvers, from areas that we wouldn't have looked in the past. Harvard wanted to study this phenomena, so they studied years of data 
at an incentive and hundreds of successfully solved problems with some fascinating results. First, they found that, that much of the innovation that was happening was happening on the margin. And what I mean by that is it's where different disciplines were colliding. It was where new perspectives were brought to bear on situations where typically the same researchers in the same field would have been examining that problem. Even more astonishing is they were able to measure the degree with which that's true. So on average, a solution was being solved by someone with a background no less than six fields away from where we would have assumed that problem would have been solved. That means chemists were solving problems in biology. It means mathematicians were solving problems in computer science. It means educators were solving problems in public policy. This is an astounding finding. And it means that we need to understand the power of diversity and accessing all of our sources of innovation if we're really to push the, push the limits of how far we can take the innovation process. So how do we harness this planet of innovators, right? How do we make that work for us? Let me introduce to you the notion, the idea of a challenge. Now, we didn't choose the name challenge by accident. We recognize that the competitive psychology here was extremely important, both to drive the best solutions and to really harness that energy in a very positive way, to put it to work. Three things are very important about the challenge. It needs three things. An exceedingly well-defined problem, and that's how we push problems out to the rest of the world. I think it was Albert Einstein that once said if he had 60 minutes to save the world, he'd spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute resolving it. Those were very wise words. It turns out much care needs to be taken in defining the problem. In fact, we've created a whole methodology to manage that process. The second important thing is the audience. Sometimes um, certain challenges should be pushed to the entire world. Sometimes you need to actually seek out very specific audiences depending on the nature of the problem. Geographies, people with certain kinds of backgrounds that typically wouldn't work on that kind of a problem. Even employees of the organization should be brought to bear to work on these kinds of problems. And then the incentive structure. The incentive structure is what drives those audiences to work on those problems with passion and conviction. This can be a typically a mixture of intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. Very oftentimes there's monetary awards involved. Sometimes they don't need to be, right? So when we, uh, certain kinds of problems that we're very familiar with that we run all the time, if they're public good problems, if they're there for the, the betterment of the world, often there needs to be no money involved at all. What I would like to do is I'd like to share with you three more examples. And in these three examples, I wanna draw out who these people are, these solvers, the ones that are able to, cre to, to, to create these amazing solutions to these problems, and at the same time illustrate how varied and diverse these kinds of problems can be. The first example I'd like to share um, is one that relates to the TB Alliance. The TB Alliance is an international organization that has taken on, on the cause of finding new cures and treatments for tuberculosis, a neglected disease. And as you all know, neglected diseases typically don't get the funding from uh, large pharmaceutical companies. So the TB Alliance has taken on that entire program. In this challenge um, uh, that was offered, it was actually understood that a new drug candidate, T, uh, T, uh, PA824, which was in entering clinical trials, had a fundamental problem. As promising as that, that drug was, it would be exceedingly expensive to manufacture. And here's why because it would take three steps to manufacture, extremely expensive materials, and it turns out some of the materials were explosive. You can imagine that would be a very expensive manufacturing process. And for neglected diseases, the low cost of manufacturing is critical. So a challenge was pushed out to the world. Who could help us come up with a new approach to manufacturing PA824? Well, the final solution came from two ingenious solvers, one in China and one in India. You see pictured here, the gentleman from India. And together, this created a new manufacturing process for PA824 that the TB Alliance now has in its toolkit should that drug make it through clinical trials. But I wanted to introduce you to this solver. This solver was a, is a um, PhD in the Institute of Life Sciences in Hyderabad, India. And he's a self-proclaimed workaholic. He's asked, why aren't there more than 24 hours in a day? Somehow he found the time to work on this challenge. We asked him why he did it. He said he did it, one, because he saw the challenge, right? He would never have taken his energy and put it towards us if he didn't see a way to direct it. So the challenge was important to him. But most importantly was this. He said, my mother had tuberculosis. So here you see the money isn't important at all. This person was powered by sheer passion. 
And I think this is a beautiful illustration of the potential of people everywhere to work on these kinds of problems. The second example I wanted to provide is in education. So an independent charity based out of the UK, working with government officials, wanted to take on a in very interesting problem. How do we improve parental involvement in children's education? And so a challenge again was put out to the world. Thousands of people participated. Pictured here um, is a gentleman who's an, a, an electrical engineer with a background in robotics and artificial intelligence based out of Columbia. He actually teamed with his father and that team put forth a very interesting solution based on a deep insight. Their insight was this. One of the reasons parents don't get as involved in their children's education is that they don't know the material and, they, and they're not fresh on what material, uh, they're not fresh on the methods, what's being taught to the children. So it's shame. They're embarrassed that they can't help their children. And so the defense mechanism is not to help their children. So they created a, new, a mechanism whereby parents would be involved. They would have forewarning as to the lesson plans and they could get refresher courses on the material so they could actually help their children. And they could do that then with, with pride and confidence. The reason I love this example is I think it's poetic. A father and son winning a competition to improve parental education in children's lives. I think that's fantastic. The last example I'd like to share with you is Clean Water for Africa. So here's the backstory. Three million, people, three million children every year die from drinking con water contaminated with microorganisms. The good news, if there is good news here, is that there's a very promising technology based on solar water purification. It's low cost and it's being used already by three million people. The bad news is the process works so well and as you can imagine, um, is being adopted, but there's no real change in the water that's not pure and pure. You can't sense the difference. So there's a very strong belief that because they can't sense the difference, the users question its effectiveness. So a number of foundations got together, pooled their resources, and they wanted to push a challenge out to the rest of the world. Could we create a visual indicator that would say that the water's been processed and that it's safe to drink? Now this is important. These are extremely low cost kinds of solutions, right? We're pushing these out to the developing world. So pictured here are four graduate students from the University of Washington. They competed again with thousands of people around the world, but their solution, ingenious, is like a bottle cap. And built into this bottle cap, it's self-contained, it's self-powered, it's a robust solution, and it's ingenious. It's durable, almost 10 years. It can sense that the bottle is full of water and ready to be processed. Once the solar water purification is complete, it gives a visual signal that the water is ready to drink. And so here is an example of a group of problem solvers from one side of the world helping people on the other side of the world, which I think is an amazing testament to the power of people everywhere. So what can a connected planet of innovators achieve? I think if we took 1% of the world's population and were able to connect them to work on the problems that really matter, imagine tens of millions of problem solvers on demand working on these kinds of problems every single day. I don't think the question is, what kinds of problems can we solve? I think the question is, what kinds of problems couldn't we solve? I think we could do anything. And if you think about the kinds of problems that are facing institutions, government, industry, everywhere, we clearly need a step change in the effectiveness of innovation to achieve our goals. I think open innovation and challenges are a very powerful way to get there. What inspires me? connecting problems to problem solvers all over the world. I think if we're going to innovate our way to the future, we'll innovate our way to the future together. Thank you.